From their location next to the Rogue River, the Table Rocks formations are the ideal place from which to view the valley below. Each year, thousands of visitors hike to the top of these flat top mountains to look out on the grand vistas, see a colorful bounty of spring wildflowers, or to examine the short and fragile life cycle in a vernal pool ecosystem. They come to study and explore the many unique geological, biological, and environmental wonders that sit in our own backyard. When you watch this video, we want you to put on your explorer hat, learn what it's like to see a new plant or animal for the first time, to discover a new way of looking at something you think is familiar, or be the person who can best explain how something works or lives. This branch here probably has at least a dozen different species of lichens growing on, the, on it. And at the base you can also see that there's some, some mosses growing down there too. So just to give you a sense of, of the diversity on one branch, you can see that it might appear at first that it's just kind of all the same thing, but when you look up close, you'll start to notice that there's some, a lot of difference in the, in the types of shapes that you, that you encounter here. You could be that person, because while we know a lot about the table rocks, there still is a lot to learn. Will you be the one who answers the questions we still have about the table rocks? How old are the table rocks? The table rock andesite cap has been dated by radiometric techniques at 7 million years old. How high are they? The two horseshoe-shaped table rocks are approximately 2,000 feet in elevation about 800 feet higher than the Rogue River that flows alongside them. What's underneath? Lying underneath the harder andesite lava cap that makes up the tops of the table rocks is the softer soil of the Payne Cliffs Formation, basically soil that was deposited by ancient rivers and streams which date back to almost 37 million years ago. It's what makes up most of the Rogue Valley floor. How did those mounds on top get there? There are three principal theories about how these mounds were formed. Wind and water is one idea. Freezing and thawing is another. And one theory suggests that giant prehistoric gophers made them. What do you think? The imposing cliffs of the Table Rocks are a familiar sight to Rogue Valley residents and passerbys. But just what are the Table Rocks and how were they formed? The Table Rocks are volcanic buttes. A butte is a small, steep-sided mountain. They are called upper and lower because one lies up the river from the other. And then about seven million years ago, after this erosion was taking place, uh, you had the beginnings of the High Cascades volcanoes that started to form, and you had lava flows and volcanoes that were beginning to erupt, and you had a very large lava flow that erupted from Olson Mountain. So Olson Mountain is up near Lost Creek Lake, Lost Creek Reservoir. You can't see the volcano anymore. All you see is the eroded remnants of it. But you could see this lava flow that kind of starts up there and you could trace little pieces and fragments of it all the way down here. So at one time there was this large lava flow, seven million years old, that flowed down the ancestral Rogue River Valley. So it essentially flowed down and kind of filled in the whole valley as it flowed down. And then since then, erosion has taken place. And what has happened is erosion has cut down uh, along the Rogue River and has cut down and eroded down into the Payne Cliffs Formation, these sandstones that we were talking about. And the sandstones and conglomerates are more easily eroded. So they tend to be more easily eroded by the Rogue River or the ancestral Rogue River. And then leaving behind only this, the, the areas that are the most resistant that are capped by these lava flows. So the term that we kind of give this type of geological process is called inverted topography. So what was once in the bottom of a valley is now at the top of a hill. And currently the uh, table rocks here are about 800 feet above the level of the Rogue River Valley. So there's quite a bit of erosion that's taken place and then leaving behind those remnants of table rocks sitting up high. There's another diagram that's really, really great and kind of illustrating the same idea and this is the one that was put together by the BLM and again what it shows is it shows the ancestral Rogue River Valley and then about seven million years ago you had the eruption of Olson Mountain you had lava flows the lava flow is actually called andesite which is a type of the volcanic rock that makes up the lava flows 
and that lava flow came down and filled in that ancestral Rogue River Valley. And then over time, the Rogue River began to cut through and erode uh, the underlying material, and then you had slumping and other processes that essentially started to remove a lot of fragments of the lava flow. Uh, and then you had even smaller remnants that were preserved, and then finally you only have a few remnants of the lava flow preserved. Now, there's lots of fragments of this lava flow. Upper Table Rock and Lower Table Rock are the most prominent. So, if you actually hike uh, Lower Table Rock, get to the top, and actually look to the west, you can actually see another peak that's capped by the same lava flow, and I believe that's called Castle Rock. So, Castle Rock is another example of this hill that's capped by a lava flow. And then if you go to Lost Creek Lake or Lost Creek Reservoir, if you drive around and you don't go into the fish hatchery, but you stay on the highway and go up the hill. If you look to your right, you'll see this very, you know, you'll see these columns of, of material along the highway road cut. That's the same lava flow. So you can find portions of that same lava flow up near Lost Creek Lake. So you can find little bits and pieces of it along the ancestral Rogue River Valley. Erosional processes continue to shape the landscape and break down the table rocks. It is likely someday, upper and lower table rocks will no longer be the prominent features in the Rogue Valley they are today. The table rocks are an excellent place to tell the story of the first people to call this valley home, and about what happened when the European explorers and settlers arrived. It's believed that people have lived in the Rogue River Valley for at least 15,000 years. Archaeologists have found arrows and projectiles called Clovis points that have been dated to about that time. When European explorers and trappers first entered the valley, they found two main tribes. They were the Shasta, who lived in the upper Bear Creek drainage near present-day Ashland, and the Dakilna, who occupied the rest of the Rogue Valley. They had similar cultures, but they spoke different languages. Pronounced Dakilma, the Native Americans lived along the middle and upper Rogue River, including the Table Rocks area. The Dakilma were actually two distinct groups who spoke a similar language. One group is known as the Lowland Dakilma, and who go by the name Dakilma, which means those living alongside the river. And the Upland Dakilma, or Lagawa, whose name means those living in the uplands. The Dakilma were foragers. Subgroups of the main tribe were made up of bands of extended families who would move about, generally traveling from the lower elevations in the spring to the higher elevations in the summer and early fall, and then returning to their semi-permanent villages along the river during the winter months. The Dakilma followed the food. Salmon was an important food source. They were caught using hooks and line. And salmon were abundant. Early white explorers remarked how the Dakilma captured spawning salmon from small streams by scooping them up by hand and tossing the fish onto the bank. Springtime was the time for collecting camas bulbs, and fall was the time for collecting acorns, both staples of the native diet. Deer, elk, and rabbits were hunted with the atlatl, a small dart-like projectile that was thrown using a special shaped stick made of antler horns. Although the Dakilma did not practice a widespread form of agriculture, the planting and harvesting of crops, they did grow a form of tobacco, and they did manage the land. During the fall, the Dakilma women conducted controlled burns. These burns made acorns more visible for collecting, subdued encroaching vegetation in the oak savanna and chaparral, and kept grasslands open for foraging deer and elk populations. They also managed the wild camas fields. During the winter, the bands of the tribes would gather in a few semi-permanent villages. Their homes were rectangular structures covered in split sugar pine planks or bark slabs. Wooden steps inside the doorway led down into the structure. The floors were made of packed dirt. The interior consisted of a ring of space around the inside at ground level, with an excavated pit area in the middle having a central fire hearth. Baskets and food supplies hung on the walls and from the ceilings. The winter months were used for making and repairing baskets, sharpening tools, and for teaching the young the ways of the tribe, its histories and traditions. The Table Rocks are among the most popular hiking trails in our region, 
and the botanical treasures they offer is one of the major reasons why. Ask any hiker on the trail between March and June, and they will likely tell you the spectacular and diverse wildflowers are one of the attractions that prompted their visit. The Table Rocks are botanically special for several reasons. They are a crossroads of several different ecoregions and consequently contain plants unique to those ecoregions. The Table Rocks provide a unique opportunity to see, in a relatively small area, several distinct plant communities or habitat types. There are four distinct plant communities present on the Table Rocks. Keep in mind that nature is more complex than our descriptions. These communities often overlap and do not have definite boundaries. As you begin your hike on the Table Rocks, you will find open grasslands dotted with shrubs, the occasional ponderosa pine, and stately white oaks. This is the oak savanna. It is appropriate the community is named after the oaks as they provide homes and food for a variety of wildlife in this habitat. Some of these oaks, though modest in size, may be three to 400 years old, placing them among the oldest trees in the Rogue Valley. This means that some of the oaks we see today were providing the Native Americans with acorns before Euro-American settlement began. They are a living link to our region's history. As the trail continues up towards the top of the Table Rocks, the slope steepens and the ground becomes rockier. Fewer large trees are present, but a denser growth of shrubs. This is the chaparral community. These shrubs are adapted to hot, dry conditions and harsh rocky clay soils, and they are especially well adapted to frequent fires. In fact, many of these shrubs depend on fire for rejuvenation. Buckbrush seeds will only germinate after a fire, while manzanita re-sprouts from its resilient deep root mass after a fire. The leaves of these plants contain flammable oils that actually help them burn. On the slopes below the andesite lava cap that makes up the top of the table rocks, the landscape makes another change into a different plant community, the mixed woodland. This community includes deeper, richer soil that supports denser stands of many different types of trees. Wildflowers are not as abundant in this shady environment, but there are a few standouts, such as red bells, cat's ear lily, false Solomon's seal, starflower, and Western Columbine. Upon reaching the tops of the Table Rocks, the fourth plant community, the Mounted Prairie Vernal Pools, is encountered. Here at the top of the Table Rocks, there is only a very thin layer of soil overlying the lava rock, chunks of which protrude all around. Grasses and wildflowers dominate this environment. The Vernal Pools are a unique and rare type of habitat. Pools form in the winter and spring and then disappear in the dry months. As they dry out in late spring, rings of wildflowers bloom in the remaining water and around the edges. One of these flowers is the dwarf woolly meadow foam, which grows only on the tops of the two table rocks. You are now at the top of the table rocks and have traveled through and seen four distinct plant communities. The next time you go up the hiking trail, see if you are able to identify each community and their differences. Despite being in close proximity to a number of towns like Central Point, White City, and Medford, the Table Rocks are inhabited by a diverse wildlife population. So this little guy is called a Western Fence Lizard. He's one of many reptiles that you'll see while hiking the Table Rocks. Western Fence Lizards have a beautiful blue belly that if they're a male, they actually like to do push-ups and shine their blue belly to attract a female. The important thing about western fence lizards is when they've been bitten by a tick, their blood actually kills Lyme disease and ticks. So they do an important regulation on um, the spread of Lyme's disease. So there he is, he's doing his push-ups for us, trying to attract a mate and shine his blue belly. They have a detachable tail that is an adaptation which allows them to survive. So the last thing you see of a western fence lizard before it goes under a rock is its tail. That's the same thing that a predator sees just before it goes on. So a predator will grab the tail, the western fence lizard will get away and survive. 
This is the Pahi, or pocket gopher, and it's well adapted for digging and living underground. They have small eyes, very small ears, and a fur that is pretty streamlined. They also have very loose skin, so they can turn around in their burrows and tunnels. The pocket gopher gets its name from its fur-lined cheek pouches. These pouches have their openings outside the mouth, which allows the gopher to dig with its teeth without getting dirt inside its mouth. As you hike the trail, be sure to look for its mounds out in the open areas. So what we're looking at here is a granary tree. And a granary tree is made from acorn woodpeckers. Acorn woodpeckers work together in a family and they spend the fall collecting acorns and putting them inside these old dead snags, an important um, item in a forest is dead trees because it creates a lot of habitat for many different species including the acorn woodpecker. So in these little holes they place the acorn so that during the winter time when there's not as many insects for them to eat this is their food source. They make a sound like wicka 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 and they also um, have a flight pattern that where they flap 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 drop down flap 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 drop down so woodpeckers fly up and down and up and down which is one way that you can tell woodpeckers um, if you see a bird in the distance. There is one animal you can see from almost anywhere on the table rocks in the parking lot on the trail or up on the top but to see it you have to look up it's the turkey vulture you'll see soaring on the wind near the cliffs. The turkey vulture is very noticeable with its long wings small head and long narrow tail. Now I didn't say it was beautiful, but it is always noticeable. The featherless head is of course an adaptation for acquiring food. The turkey vulture is a carrion eater, which means it eats dead animals. Do you know why not having feathers on its heads helps it as a scavenger? To feed, a turkey vulture sometimes has to stick its head into a dead carcass, which might have germs, larvae, and grubs feeding on the same food it wants. If it had feathers on its head, they might get caked with blood, grubs, or larva, and it would be hard to clean and might get diseased. But having an ugly, featherless head helps it keep itself clean after a meal. These are just a few of the many animals and birds that live on the table rocks. Some are very small, some are big, some live underground, some fly overhead, some only come out at night. And the table rocks are one place to see the federally listed threatened species of fairy shrimp. Frequent wildfires have shaped the North American landscape for thousands of years. As a result, most native plants and animal species and plant communities have evolved, adapted, and are often dependent upon the reoccurrence of fire. Rogue Valley summers are hot and dry enough that lightning ignited fires occur frequently. At the Table Rocks, the landscape historically experienced low intensity fire as often as every three to five years. In addition to lightning caused fires, Native Americans in this region dramatically shaped the landscape by intentionally lighting fire in the forest. Fire served as a tool to extensively manage the land and maintain a healthy ecosystem, and it is still used by land managers today. It also served a variety of other purposes. The use of fire promotes healthier, more abundant food resources. It maintains open habitat for deer and elk, which prefer freshly sprouted vegetation. In turn, large game is easier to hunt in cleared areas. Native Americans used fire as a tool during warfare to force enemy tribes to evacuate their homes. Smoke from fires was used as a cover or to signal tribal members to gather for warfare. Just as some plant species need fire to regenerate, some plant communities require periodic fire to maintain their health or even their existence. Grasslands and oak savanna are two such fire-dependent plant communities. A light surface fire will not kill an established oak tree, but will thin out undergrowth and seedlings of other plant species, which would otherwise encroach on the open, grassy understory of the oak savanna. Animal species also rely on fire to stimulate new plant growth for foraging and to maintain diverse habitat types. Burned plants give the soil nutrients, Nutrients from burned organic material are recycled back into the earth and enrich the soil. Seeds of many plants will actually lay dormant in the soil until there is a fire, 
and then they will sprout in the nutrient-rich soil. Plants like buckbrush and manzanita have seeds with a hard shell that require the heat from fire to break them open so they can sprout. Both of these brush species encourage fire by shedding their barks and twigs. When burned, nutrients from this fire-prone fuel load are recycled into the soil below the plant. Fire clears brush and debris that can cover the forest floor and prevent other plants from sprouting. Low-intensity fires that clear brush and debris decrease the likelihood of a large, severe wildfire. In order to remain healthy, plants and trees need space to obtain proper nutrients, sunlight, and water. When fire is suppressed, trees become crowded and shade-tolerant species dominate, decreasing a forest's diversity. A diverse forest is a healthy forest, providing a greater variety of habitats and food for wildlife, as well as forest products for humans. Regular intervals of fire help to keep pests and diseases from taking over plant communities, helping keep the plants healthy. Many animals depend on plants as a food source. An animal's survival can be threatened when diseases and pests take over a plant community. Regular, low-intensity fire intervals destroys noxious weed infestations, making more room and a healthier environment for native plants. However, high-intensity fires may actually help noxious weed spread because they do well in disturbed areas. Trees that do not survive a forest fire turn into food and homes for bugs and small cavity-nesting animals. There are actually more living species in and on a dead log than a live tree. Fire helps create these important habitats and maintain a diverse and healthy forest. Despite the many benefits of fire, for several decades, fire suppression was the accepted policy on public lands. Prior to the dominance of fire suppression as a land management strategy, most Western ecosystems experienced relatively frequent, low to moderate severity fires that burned off leaf litter, underbrush, and dead vegetation, preventing these fuels from accumulating. Suppressing these natural fires has allowed fuel to build up, increasing the risk and frequency of high-intensity, high-severity fire. Fire suppression can have negative effects on many fire-dependent species, such as an increase in disease, insect infestation, and displacement by non-native weeds. Returning fire to the ecosystem of the West is a serious and important challenge facing land managers today. Decades of fire suppression have resulted in a naturally heavy fuel loads. Suburban development expanded the wildland urban interface or the area where wildland and development meet. Thus, reintroducing fire must be done with the utmost planning and precaution, often a combination of practices such as reducing fuel loads by manually removing overgrown vegetation, planning prescribed burns, and managing naturally ignited fires is necessary. By gradually restoring natural fire patterns on public lands, we can protect ecosystem health, natural resources, human life, communities and property.